Hey, welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of peritonitis, and I'll mainly be focusing on peritonitis in children. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The stellar images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show you a few cases of peritonitis, highlighting key teaching points throughout. All right, this first case was a two-year-old male that presented to the emergency department with left facial swelling. And here we have an ultrasound of the left parotid gland. You can see that the gland is heterogeneous in echo texture. Whenever scanning the parotid gland, it's important to scan the contralateral gland just for comparison purposes. And we can better see just how heterogeneous that parenchyma is compared to the normal right parotid gland. Also, what else do you notice? That left gland is enlarged relative to the normal right gland. When we add color Doppler, we can see that there's increased vascular flow throughout that abnormal left parotid gland. Also seen on sagittal imaging here, you can just see how markedly hypervascular that is. Further delineated when we add microvascular flow imaging, MV flow, which can detect slow flow in small caliber vessels. And do you notice anything else about that left parotid gland? You can see that there are some enlarged lymph nodes adjacent to it. When we focus in on those, we see enlarged left level 2 lymph nodes here that are likely reactive. And this is a typical appearance for parotitis. Peritonitis is inflammation of the parotid glands, and the parotid glands are paired salivary glands that sit just in front of the ears. Acute peritonitis is usually infectious and often viral. Most commonly, that will be due to mumps in children, and that's usually bilateral. Bacterial peritonitis can also occur, typically from Staph aureus, but that's seen more as a superlative peritonitis in premature infants and immunosuppressed children, so less common than viral. As we saw in this case, the ultrasound appearance of peritonitis is as an enlarged heterogeneous hyperemic gland or glands, and lymphadenopathy may be present. Given that peritonitis can be bilateral, it's important to do comparison scanning of the other gland. And in the setting of bacterial peritonitis, it can be complicated by abscess formation, so it's important to look for a dominant collection. All right, let's look at a different patient. This was a 14-year-old male that presented with acute onset of right facial swelling. And this appearance of the parotid gland is a bit different than the last case. There are numerous small little hypoechoic to anechoic foci scattered throughout the gland diffusely. And when we compare to the contralateral normal left parotid gland, you can see just how normal and homogeneous the parenchyma should be. And we can also get a sense that the abnormal right gland is also enlarged. And this appearance is known as the pomegranate sign for those of you who like fruit. <laughs> and that can be seen in the setting of acute parotitis. And we'll see these uniform anechoic foci scattered throughout the gland, giving it an almost punched out appearance. It's similar to the giraffe pattern that can be seen with pseudonodular formation in Hashimoto's thyroiditis in the thyroid gland. And you can get a better sense of that when we look at this in real time imaging, just these innumerable anechoic to hypoechoic, fairly uniform foci scattered diffusely throughout the abnormal gland. There's also some lymphadenopathy there, reactive. Okay, let's look at the final case. This was a boy in his early teens presenting with persistent cheek swelling despite antibiotic therapy. And at first glance, this case may look similar to the prior case where we have these multiple anechoic to hypoechoic rounded foci scattered throughout the gland. The gland is heterogeneous. But as we look a bit more closely, what's different here? Well, these rounded lesions are non-uniform in size, and some of them have small echogenic areas within them. This one is actually echogenic and shadowing, telling us that there are some calcifications. There's also some heterogeneous debris within some of these cystic foci. This appearance is typical for juvenile recurrent peritonitis. So this is a recurrent inflammatory peritonitis that occurs in children of unknown etiology. It's rare, but it's actually the second most common cause of peritonitis in childhood after mumps. Remember, mumps was the most common viral cause. It often begins between the ages of three and six with episodes of intermittent inflammation, but then it typically resolves spontaneously after puberty. It's usually idiopathic, but it can be a presenting symptom of Sjogren syndrome, lymphoma, and underlying immunodeficiency, such as HIV. So it's important to screen patients for these diseases. It may be unilateral or bilateral. In this case, the patient did have bilateral disease, and it will have this typical appearance of multiple hypoechoic foci of salivary secretions scattered throughout the gland, possibly with these small central calcifications. And that's what can help you differentiate it from the pomegranate sign of acute peritonitis the non-uniformity, and the internal echogenic foci. Because this is a chronic recurrent process, the color Doppler appearance of the parotid gland may be normal. When we look at this parotid gland on real-time imaging, this is a sagittal cine of the right gland. You can get a better sense of how diffuse these 
non-uniform cystic foci are. There's one of those echogenic shadowing foci. And as we continue through the gland, here's another one. Just diffuse involvement with these irregular non-uniform cysts containing debris and echogenic foci. And just to mention some additional causes of peritonitis that we did not discuss, one would be sialoviasis, which is stone disease and obstruction. Autoimmune causes like Sjogren's syndrome, which most commonly presents with dry eyes and dry mouth, as well as chronic sclerosing sialadenitis. Infectious causes, in addition to the viral and bacterial causes that we discussed, HIV and tuberculosis can also cause peritonitis and sarcoidosis, although that's very rare in children. All right, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you found this lecture educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Apple or Spotify, or by clicking the YouTube subscribe button. Why not subscribe to all three? <laughs> to see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, follow us on social media or check the YouTube community tab, and you can find those links in the show notes. Until next time, radiology is life. <laughs>